Okay, welcome to our presentation on how to make infrastructure as code easier for developers. So we know the developers are playing a larger role in the entire software development lifecycle. So, and, but that is now including provisioning their cloud resources that they need. So as these roles have expanded and we're asking more developers, like how are we helping them solve the complexity that is also happening in infrastructure provisioning? So that is what we're here to talk to you about today. Um, I am joined with Cesar Rodriguez and Yusuf Kantwala. Did I pronounce it correctly? All right. And um, I am Danielle Cook. I am a CNCF ambassador and I'm also a VP at AppCD. So now I'll throw it over to you two to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm Cesar Rodriguez, VP of Engineering at AppCD. Hey, uh, hey guys. I am Yusuf Kachwala and I am an engineer at AppCD. And uh, I have made some open source contributions earlier. So I'm very happy about that. Awesome. So let's just jump right in and start off with why infrastructure as code can be hard for developers. So we're going to kind of go back and forth on this, and I'm going to throw it over to Yusuf. Talk to me about the learning curve and tool proliferation. Absolutely. Uh, the learning curve is huge, and there are so many tools out there, right? Uh, there, are, uh, there are multiple tools, Terraform, AWS CloudFormation template, ARM templates, Ansible, Puppet, Chef. There are generalized tools versus there are specialized tools. So it's very difficult to identify which are the specialized ones and which are the general purpose tools, right? Like Helm is very specific for Kubernetes, but then Terraform helps you deploy everything, right? So it's very difficult for a new developer who's entering into infrastructure space to identify, you know, in, uh, developers are not infrastructure experts, right? And apart from that, so many tools, and then there is absence of standardizations across all the IAC tools, right? It's very difficult to determine what is the best practice across all the tools. So it, it can significantly vary between a Terraform uh, and a Helm and a ARM template, right? Um, there are, you often run into interoperability issues. For example, you want to, you want to, deploy your resources using Terraform, but then you want your applications to deploy to get deployed on containers or Kubernetes through Helm. Then you have to make sure all of those resources work in synergy, right? You don't want them to misbehave. Uh, and infrastructure tools are progressing at and developing at such a rapid pace. You have to keep up with all the updates, right? And you have to always keep on updating your IAC with the latest and the greatest and the most updated standard, which is very difficult to keep up. You have to have you have your day job, you have to learn, and then you have to understand what is new as well as what is old, because what's old is getting deprecated. You have to remove it from your IAC, right? So there's a steep learning, uh, there are lots of tools, steep learning curves. There's tool specific learning. Some tools are in JSON format, some are in YAML format, some are in their own <clears throat> uh, syntax, right? So it's very difficult, uh, very steep learning curve. They all have their own terminologies, right? Uh, so yeah, I mean, there is it's quite hard. a bit there. So be a developer, be an expert in developing code and also be an expert in all of this and stay up to date with the latest. Um, all right, Caesar, talk to me about cloud complexity. Yeah, so similarly to the proliferation of tools, um, the the cloud itself is complex and always evolving. Like what you knew about last year is different this year because it's all new things are coming, new approaches of doing things are coming. And in order to meet your business requirements as a developer, um, having to spend time learning all these little nuances on how to best use your cloud environment can detract you from, from, from doing your business objectives as a developer, which is coding itself. So um, that's one of the biggest challenges on IAC is not only that the tools are hard, but also that the cloud itself, uh, there's a lot to learn there. Well, and like, that's just great. Right? There's a lot to learn. And then we have all the other things you're trying to learn and also just trying to be a developer and do your day job. Um, Yusuf, talk to me about version control. 
Yeah, I mean, most of the IACs are, you know, uh, uh, they are managed through virgin controlling, right? But virgin control have their own set of problems, right? So for example, uh, you can, you the developers, DevOps have the ability, or most of the people have the ability to make changes to a given resource outside of the IAC, right? And then making IAC consistent with what is there in the cloud you know, it's difficult. You have to manage the drift between what is there in the ISE and what is there in the cloud. M many times uh, your ISE can contain s sensitive information. So you have to make sure that you don't check in those inside your IAC uh, version control, right? Also, if there are multiple developers working on the same project, and if they make conflicting changes, your, your deployment can go for a toss, right? Uh, and the most difficult one is rollbacks. So if you've deployed something with the latest IAC and it, it if it, you know, uh, destroys your setup or, you know, something is not working on your prod and you want to roll back, making your IAC consistent or your version control consistent with your IAC, which is now good, getting deployed, can be, is is a task, right? So it's going to be really complex rolling back your IAC, rolling back your version control to the, the last version, which works, right? So yeah, managing uh, version control is sometimes really challenging. Well, and I think that relates nicely to where we're going next, which is all around drift management. So Caesar, you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, so we've all been there. You have the best IAC possible, but there's an incident in production and I have to make a change, quick change to make things work because something is down. And that's one of the main causes that I've seen drift happen. And by drift, we mean that your IAC is no longer the source of truth of what your cloud environment is. So your cloud environment is saying something, but your IAC is saying something else. And like I said, there might be legitimate use cases where you broke the glass because you're trying to solve a production issue. But now you have to, after the incident, when all is said and done, you have to go back and update your infrastructure as code and make sure that it is always the source of truth for what is in your cloud environment, which, for, which is where drift management comes into play. Well, and that relates nicely to security concerns. Gonna take that too, Caesar? Yeah, sure, definitely. Yeah, so, so security uh, is always gonna be important um, with the old way of doing things where you're scanning your cloud environments, making sure everything is secure. And it also can cause drift because if you're fixing an, an issue in production, now you have to go back and fix that as well in your infrastructure as code. So you can do a scanning on the infrastructure as code level as well, which, but, but it will be even better if your code is secure by default from the beginning. So security when, when doing IC, it's a chore, you have to scan your code. Um, you have to fix those issues that were found in the code before they get introduced in your cloud environment. Um, but it might be better if you can be secure by default. Well, and you have loads of obviously options of things like scanning after the fact, but after the fact means it's after the fact. It's going to take time and energy to fix it. It could end up in production and like how much how important is security to you? And I think we all can agree it is a very important thing. So now let's talk about developers' frustrations with infrastructure as code. So Caesar, let's talk about delayed deployments. Sure. Yeah, so one of the biggest frustrations I've heard as a manager from developers is, hey, I worked on my code, but now I'm responsible as well to writing this infrastructure as code to deploy my application uh, into the cloud. And it's it's one of the biggest excuses I've heard is uh, I can't meet the deadline because I'm having some problems with the cloud or with my infrastructure as code, which in turn um, causes delays with the business requirements and some of the deadlines that we have to meet. So it's definitely one of the biggest frustrations from developers. Well, and it is a knock on effect to the business, right? Because if delayed deployments mean you're not getting a feature out, you're not getting a functionality out, you're not getting something out, 
that your customers want, whether it's internal customers, external customers, and that can really impact customer satisfaction, customer retention. So it really is important to keep all of this in perspective on like how it is impacting the business. So Yusuf, let's talk, you kind of mentioned it earlier today around when we were talking about um, the learning curve, but let's talk about lack of expertise. Dig a little bit deeper on that. Yes, of course. So as I mentioned earlier, developers are not hired to be infrastructure experts, right? So when they are uh, developing or uh, deploying their infrastructure or writing IAC for their infrastructure, they have to really understand how a given cloud provider works, how authentication works, how authorizations work, how different cloud providers provide different resource types. Uh, similarly, it's not just the resources, they have to also understand the concepts within the cloud provider, how the networking for the cloud provider works, how the load balancers work, how the security aspects work, uh, policies, encryption, PLS. And apart from that, they have to also think about the architecture, the scalability, the high availability, <clears throat> the performance, compliance and governance. The architecture also right, can vary as, uh, at what point of time you are there in the uh, in your uh, in your company right so uh, when you are a small startup the the way you deploy your infrastructure is different and as you start scaling the scaling requirements change which means your infrastructure also has to change to adapt to the changing requirements right so yeah uh, there are a lot of things and a lot of moving parts over there so every developer who has to deploy infrastructure has to go around and figure out what's the best for him everywhere, right? So, yeah. it's a lot. And then that leads us on to policy uncertainty nicely. Caesar, let's talk about that from a developer point of view. Sure, so, <clears throat> so in terms of a developer, you're always trying to get your application ready, your code ready, your application deployed and things working but you may not be aware of all the policies and governance requirements that your organization or company may have. And, and this is where your, your IAC may not be compliant with some of those policies and you're writing the IAC without the knowledge or of what are those policies from a compliance perspective that you, that you need to meet which is a risk that we're, that you're taking on as a developer and as an organization, um, especially if there's no standards around how IC should be written, which can lead to vulnerabilities and weaknesses in your security posture. Awesome. So, you know, we've talked about why it's frustrating, but let's talk about what the developer experience with infrastructure as code should be and how it should help them. So Yusuf, over to you. Well, um, so as Caesar mentioned, right, there are delays in deployments because developers don't know something, they are not experts in something, they have a steep learning curve, there are lots of tools, they don't know which ones to use. So uh, I would always, uh, there is a lot of cloud complexity, there are lots of moving parts over there. So I would want my experience as a developer that I don't have to take care of any of those. There is someone or some tool which helps me do that, right? So it helps me avoid the learning curve of all the tools. It helps me avoid or uh, avoid understanding the complexities of the cloud. It helps me provision the permissions exactly as I want. I don't want to over provision something. So uh, yeah, <clears throat> because provision, security, all of these are very important aspects. And as a developer who doesn't have a lot of exposure to these things, it they end up spending a lot of time just to make sure they're doing the right thing. And then testing, deployment, everything, you know, it's it just takes a lot of time, right? So I would really want uh, to avoid getting into the whole learning curve or some, some tool that, you know, simplifies my experience over there. Then the generation of IAC. So understanding the cloud is one part, but then writing it with a certain standard is a different part. There are certain best practices that I need to implement. I need to you know, harden my modules that I'm writing in IAC, which can be, again, a different, it requires you experience, it requires skills to do that. So yeah, and if there is some tool which can just auto-generate my whole IAC, uh, avoiding me to go understand what security policies mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
avoid me understanding all the different concepts and abstracts of IAC. I would love that, right? And the most important part is the security. Like I don't want to deploy an IAC which has or uh, IAC which has some vulnerability inside of it, which may eventually expose and compromise my company's infrastructure, right? So how, I would always want that uh, the IAC that I deploy is has the highest security standards embedded inside of it so that I don't have to take care. Something goes wrong, I am not the one to be in the firing line, right? So yeah, I mean, that's the best DevOps experience. Some magical wand which understands my code creates an ISC for me and then avoids all the learning curve, provisions exactly the kind of permissions I want and makes my life easy. Well, and that leads nicely to generative infrastructure from code. So I want to quickly define infrastructure from code. So really infrastructure as from, from code uses your application source code as, as your truth. It assumes that you, the developer, have written your application code in a certain way with certain you know, variables included. And if we just look at your infrastructure, if we just look at your application, we can then infer what your infrastructure as code should be. So it's this whole kind of fundamental shift of get your IAC from your application code and do that with all of your standards put in place, whether it's least privilege, whatever best practices, all the things that your organization and you yourself want in place to make sure your application is secure. So we're gonna dig in a little bit more on this and we're gonna talk about the benefits of infrastructure from code. So Caesar, over to you, talk to me about some of these benefits. Sure. So, so the first benefit is that it makes your processes streamline. So when the source of truth for your infrastructure is your application itself, you know that you're not going to be over provisioned, that the services and resources that your, your application need are going to be coming from what your code actually says. So you don't have to talk to a DevOps expert to get your code out there. Um, and the process of getting your application from source code into production, it's gonna be a more pleasant experience as your application source code remains the source of truth. At the same time, since you're generating that, um, that um, your cloud deployment with standards by default, you don't have to try to figure out, hey, what are this security guardrails or what is my governance and policy uh, guardrails from an operational perspective? Because um, once, your infrastructure requirements are deducted from your code, the policy guide rails are also going to be applied by default. So you don't have to um, spend that co cognitive knowledge into learning and understanding what that is. And also it's going to be context aware from development all the way to deployment. Um, everyone is going to have the same level of understanding of what the system needs to do because everything is coming from the same place. Awesome. And so, you know, there are different types of infrastructure from code, different approaches to this. So Caesar, talk to me about kind of the three approaches we want to highlight. Sure. So the so first approach is an SDK based approach where you can um, embed instructions for the tooling within your source code to say what your infrastructure requirements are. Um, there are pros and cons to that, especially the con is that you is still require some knowledge of how your infrastructure should look like. The second approach is a completely new programming language where you have to learn the exact programming language based approach to managing your infrastructure. And then the last approach, which is the one that we recommend is doing static code analysis. And this is just understanding the application as it's written normally with your normal business requirements and then deducting the infrastructure requirements from there. And so where you know we talk about uh, static code analysis, and I think the benefit of this is it doesn't have to disrupt any of your workflows. So Caesar, do you want to kind of explain this a bit? Yeah, so and, and this is the approach that we follow and recommend, which is doing static code analysis. And this is when you have your code artifacts, your source code, 
be a Java, Python, Golang, and your configuration files. We do static code analysis on that, on those artifacts to then determine what, is the, what are the possible infrastructure dependencies based on what we will observe and generate Terraform or Helm charts or any other IC based on that knowledge, which then uh, streamlines your process of CI CD and deploying and provisioning your infrastructure and deploying your application into your cloud. So this fits into your existing pipelines. There's no disruption into what you have to do from a development perspective and minimal disruption into what you have to do from an operational perspective. So something that your developers would really like. Don't have to go learn a new thing. You just insert it into your existing process. Right. So moving on, uh, you know, outcomes from infrastructure from code. I'll just quickly run through this. You know, with infrastructure from code, you get a more streamlined process with where you uh, can get things into market faster. Your customers are happy again, whether they're internal customers or external customers, and you're developers actually feel empowered. Like you, the developer, are like, great, I can create infrastructure as code easily from my application code, and I'm not delaying everything. I'm not frustrated. I don't have wasted time at my organization, so everyone's happier. And then you get a more secure and compliant um, infrastructure application, all of those things, which helps the organization as a whole reduce the risk. So there are some definitely some big outcomes that you can get from infrastructure from code that impact your entire organization. So I'm going to quickly do a whistle stop tour of AppCD, and then we're going to jump into a demo of that. So AppCD provides infrastructure from code. We analyze, visualize, and generate your infrastructure as code with governance applied, all the security and standards you need. So we'll look at your application code. We'll analyze whether it's Python or a Java app. We'll understand what infrastructure you need. And then we'll infer different things, your API, service configuration, ingress, egress, all of those things. Based on that analysis, we'll then create a visualization of that. So you get a view of your deployment architecture, and then you can enhance it. So, you know, in a perfect world, it would be perfect, but we know it is not a perfect world. So like you'll want to maybe connect a database but differently, or you'll want to add something to enhance that architecture. And you can just simply drag and drop it in that visualization. And the nice thing is we will validate that, um, that architecture. So if you're not allowed to do something, we won't let you connect it. Uh, so it helps give you some guardrails in place as a developer who is trying to create infrastructure as code. And then finally, once you're happy with it, we will generate Terraform or Helm charts that are consistent. And we'll do that with all your golden standards applied. So least privileged access control, like any policies from AWS or Azure that are really important for you. And then also any compliance requirements, HIPAA, GDPR, SOC 2, all of those good things. So that is, again, the whistle stop tour. Now I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to ask Caesar to give us a little demo of that. Sure. All right. So this is our App City demo org where we have a handful of repositories that you can use to play around with App City. Uh, the first one that I'm going to show you is a repo called Retroboard. Retroboard, sorry. This is a um, Python application that uh, allows you to do retrospectives. We developed this ourselves, and it's really good for demos. And just to take you uh, to a quick, quick walkthrough of what the actual application does. So this is what the main screen looks like. If you let's just name it Retro and give it three. What went well, what can be improved, and actions. So if you can create your own retro board, and um, basically there's some APIs behind the scenes handling this um, communication from the UI, and here you can create different cards if you're doing a retro, and you can also send an email summary to an email. So that's what the sample app does. So Obviously, there's um, three services hand handling these operations from this uh, application under the hood. So let's onboard it to AppCity. 
And this is available at appcity.io. I'm just using our production environment for this demo. So I'm logging in with GitHub. And for new users, uh, you will get taken to this walkthrough of how you onboard your application. And one of the options here is generate from AppCity demo repositories. So we have retro board here as one of the options. So I'll select retro board. And it automatically added the components for this application. So these are the three APIs that I was talking about. The first one is an API. This is located on the function slash API directory. Uh, we're using the main branch in Python. Uh, the second one is called send email, and that's available in functions email summary. And the third component is called send Slack alert, and it's called it's in functions Slack alerts within that repository. So I'll go ahead and click proceed. For this example, I'm going to use AWS Lambda. I'll click proceed. And I'll call this retroboard demo. And I'll hit create. And once I hit create, what the system is doing under the hood is it's cloning that repository. And then we're performing static code analysis on the repository to help us understand what are all the infrastructure dependencies required by these applications and how can we get the different components of the application um, provisioned and deployed. So this usually takes around a minute or two as we analyze that code. And the output of this will be a topology of the things that we found. So as you can see here, we have a topology represented that includes the three different services that we talked about. So these are Lambda functions. If you click on any of these, you'll get a, an option here to configure any of the parameters. Um, a lot of these are pre-populated with details that we found within the source code itself. And some of them will be highlighted here. They that you need to add additional information. For example, in this SNS topic name, we can give it a name. To get rid of those errors. And the nice, there's a couple of uh, benefits here. Um, since we did static code analysis, we understood what are all of these different dependencies based on what we saw on the source code. So a question people ask me is, how do you do this? So let me show you real quick. We go to retro board. We go to functions where these uh, different APIs are located. Let's just click on API and click on main. And I'm just going to find that Boto tree. So this is what we're reading. We're reading the source code. We're reading that you're using a Boto tree client for SQS. We're using one for SNS, and we detect how you're using these clients within your code base. And at the end, we can generate this nice topology for you. Um, the other benefit of static code analysis is that you get least privileged policies by default. So we can observe what are some of the actions that are being performed within your code base to give you policies. If we to give you policies that are least privileged, if we um, if we can detect what you are doing within your code base. Finally, um, by default, we are applying best practices and, and the policies that I selected for my organization. If you decide that you want to change some of those settings that are not in compliance with your policies, for example, we have a policy for ensuring that billing mode is provisioned in an organization. So if you save, for this DynamoDB uh, table, we'll, you'll have a policy violation. And whenever you have a policy violation, we give you uh, this message saying that this is something that you have to fix before you can even export your IAC or view it within the UI. If there are things that we couldn't detect by static code analysis, like you didn't include it in your source code, you need additional, you're playing with a new resource, you can always click here on the bottom left to add a new resource. In this example for AWS, you can see all the resources here that we support. Let's say we add it, we want to add an S3 bucket, you can drag and drop that into the canvas, which means that the infrastructure as code for this resource is going to be generated. And if you want to also add a, an access control policy for this S3 bucket, you can connect the S3 bucket to the compute resource that you need to have access to that.
So once you're good with your topology, you can click here IC to get a sample of what your infrastructure is code will look like. Or you can click here on the top right to export your infrastructure as code. So awesome. this is one more. Wait. <laughs> There's another piece of the demo. <laughs> so um this is all nice and good, Caesar, but now how do I actually use this because I don't like UIs? So we have a CLI available. And for this CLI demo, I'm going to use this repository called Spring Pet Clinic, which is a fork from a repo from the Spring project that we where we added a few cloud dependencies. So here I have a clone of, of that Spring Pet Clinic repo. And we have the AppCD CLI here. And generating infrastructure as code for this repo is as, as easy as doing AppCD generate. And what will happen, what's happening here under the hood is the CLI is doing the analysis within my computer. So no source code is being shared with our cloud environment. This is happening locally. And once so this will be similar to the demo that I showed you with the UI, where we're doing static code analysis, extracting the dependencies, extracting the any information necessary for provisioning and deploying this application. And once that analysis is complete, we send that output to the AppCity Cloud, where we can see the topology. And the other cool thing about this is that, by default, we will add the generated IC here in the repo itself. So if I do git status, you can see that we added a Helm on a Terraform directory. In this example, this is a Kubernetes-based application. So if I do three Helm, you'll be able to see what that looks like. If I do three Terraform, here's what the Terraform files look like. And finally, there is a link here. So in case you need to go to topology to make changes, you can follow that link. And once you go to that link, the you can see the topology that has been generated for that application. And then you can follow similar steps of fixing, it, fixing any things that we couldn't detect from the code itself, like what's your image tag. And, um, and once you're ready, if you want to make any changes, similarly, you can export your infrastructure as code from the UI or get it again from the CLI itself. Very cool. Awesome. So that was our complete whistle stop tour of infrastructure from code, why it benefits you, why it will benefit you as the developer, but also if you're a, uh, a leader managing a team of developers, how this can help you at your organization. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about AppCD, you can try it at appcd.io. You can also email us any questions. We set up a cncf at appcd.com email address. And we do have a white paper that digs into how AppCD works. Uh, there was a really long URL here, um, but you know we do have it available on our website. Uh, thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Caesar, for doing this today. Uh, any final thoughts before we go? No, thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.